Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Craft and Business of Books with me, Tatiana Denford. Marissa Hussey is not with me today. She's still on maternity. So I will be asking the creative questions and the publishing questions and everything in between. This is the show that discusses not only the tools, stumbling blocks to writing, but also the rarely heard perspective from the publishing industry and everything in between. Uh, we are on every Friday at 2 p.m. Eastern. So click the link below to subscribe. So today we're talking about one of the most important themes in recent years, but especially as of last year, um, and it's diverse narratives, uh, queer owned voices, African American perspectives. Um, it's always been simmering underneath the surface and marginalized voices have always been working hard at occupying their spaces, but the publishing world just seemed to have been taking a lot longer to champion them, unfortunately. But this past year, I think, more than ever before, the industry has been forced to slow down and pay attention. Uh, Marissa and I were actually talking about this recently. And from her perspective, in the last two years, there has been a, an actual sea change in publishing in regards to opening up to voices in all spaces um, within the walls of a company and also with the books that they publish. In her career, she was, she was telling me that there is there was like a, so to speak, just well-known thing that only white middle-class people bought books. And it underlined everything. The books that were published were aimed at white people with a very specific economic ban. And then not too long ago, people actually started saying out loud that, hello, this is a catch-22, because of course only certain people bought your books because you are publishing books for a certain kind of person. And it was a, a, like an echo chamber. And there was actually no diversity in staff. They didn't have diversity in authors. And so there was no diversity in customers. In 2015, there was a study done by Lee and Lowe Books. Um, and they said that editorial roles were 82% white and less than 2% black. And anecdotally, in her second publishing job, there were actually two men in the entire office and there was like 50 people in the office. So there's a lot to unpick and we could talk for hours on the lack of diversity in publishing and why it happens. Um, and it's not news because actually recently, if you seek it out, um, there was a, a spreadsheet that was um, done on Google that surfaced this last summer and it was spread on social media everywhere and people documented what they were paid in the industry. So. We're, we have a lot of work to do um, still, but at least we're starting to have these conversations. And for me, from a creative perspective, I'm interested to see how a young, really talented writer who's had a very eclectic background creatively, and he's also has the benefit of being a digital, he's in the digital world too, as a social media specialist. I'm curious to see how somebody that can have lots of different perspectives on the industry, how do you present a manuscript in such a way that not only do you have to be compelling and your work has to be compelling, but how do you represent lots of other people who feel like they are being unheard? Is it a lot of pressure? Is it a lot of fear? Or does the fear, is that good? Does that keep you going? Um, so without further ado, um, I'm really excited to introduce our guest today. His name is Kosoko Jackson. He is a digital media specialist. He focuses on storytelling, email, social, and SMS marketing. And he's also a freelance political journalist. His personal essays and short stories have been featured on Medium, Thought Catalog, The Advocate, and lots of other literary magazines. His YA debut, Yesterday is History, will come out this year in 2021. It is published by Source Books Fire, and his adult own voices queer romantic comedy, I Am So Not Over You, will come out in 2022 by Berkeley Romance. So I'm going to bring him on. Hi. Hello. How are you? Good. Welcome. This is very exciting. I'm so excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Yay. Okay. So um, I'm just going to dive right in. Um, and we're going to start from the creative side. Sure. So, right. Let's talk about your book, Yesterday's History. And I remember um, on Twitter when you broke the news about it, it was like it was like watching 
your evolution in real time. And it was so exciting. And your unboxing was so exciting. And you, you brought me so much joy. Um, now, like obviously last year was a strange year for authors and publishers, like the pandemic, the world was on fire. <laughs> um, you know, so I want to know how that process was. Um, and we'll talk about later kind of what's going on in the pipeline for you. But so last year, talk me through it. How, how was it navigating that world with a brand new book, brand new manuscript? Sure. So yesterday's history um, was sold in 2018, like around the fall, I believe, or August, April of 2018. Time is an illusion right now. Um, and so it's been such a long time that I started writing it then. And so in 2019, the end of 2019 and during 2020, I was really focusing on editing the book. So in some ways, it was really, really great to have this tunnel vision of something that I could focus on. I lived in New York. So as many people know, New York was literally a hellscape during the pandemic. And so it was good to have something that I could just focus my mind on to get through these edits and to focus on the story that I created, literally diving into a world. But I'm. it was hard. I mean, you can only be inside your world for so long and there's just so much going on outside. There's so much going on with the pandemic, with the election, the disproportionately affected death of black people, how the world with the rise of white fascism was affecting black people. So even though I had this fantasy and the science fiction world I could live in, yesterday's history is predominantly a story about a black queer boy, someone whose marginalizations are under attack and whose existence has been under attack in this world for practically the dawn of time. So it was really hard to be able to separate those two and to figure yeah. out how do I write a happy queer science fiction love story, which is what my goal was, without letting the rest of the world bleed into it. Yeah, and I think you know, and everybody wanted like I I was been I spoke to so many writers who were saying that they particularly loved if they did end up writing, and everybody's brain was so full that when they did write something down, it was actually more often than not an escape. Yes. You know, so, but because your themes hit home, a lot of you know what you're trying to express in yesterday's history that must have felt really muddled. Did you? I mean, did you have a specific routine to your writing, or did it just come and you were doing the edits when you could, and then sometimes your brain just couldn't handle it? So I think it's a mix of both. So as you said, like I during that time I was working a pretty aggressive full time job at a marketing firm, um, which as many people probably know, marketing is a very much of a twenty four hour job, especially digital marketing with a political angle to it. So talking about all marketing and politics during the twenty nineteen year <laughs> was a lot. Uh, <laughs> so I am very much a type A neat freak about schedules. Right. So when I first get my edits from my agent, I, my editor, I'm very much someone who reads the past page, who reads the edit letter once after about two days of getting it. And then I create a plan. So I have a spreadsheet and I say, this book needs to be done in 30 days. I need to build in 10 days so I can reread it for any like typos and minor things. And yeah. I work backwards from that by breaking up the seven pages of edits into let's say fifths that I have to do every day. So it will be done in two days, which really helped me because I was lucky enough that because I work in digital media, which is one reason why when I was younger, I took the job, I'm always on my computer. So I can always sneak in 100, 200, 300 words during the day. Smart. And I was lucky to have that. So I was able to work at the most random times in the train on the way home, 30 minutes before I got to work, take out a 45 minute lunch break to try and just space out that book as much as possible, which helped balance out the stress of the world. But it's difficult. Um, many writers, I would probably say probably, and I have no numbers on this, 80, 90% of writers have a full-time job. And so it's hard to balance basically two full-time jobs at the same time. And like we said, with the pandemic on top of it, it was basically surviving in 2020 was a job. And it's funny that you said last year, because I was like, it's still 2020 and it's <laughs> not seven days until the new year. <laughs> that's true. It feels like a really long hangover. <laughs> exactly. Yes. That's never going to end. No, exactly. And it's funny because, you know, with, with a routine, you know, when you really kind of get your teeth into something, when you're editing or when you're writing, it is a job. And I think what people don't realize is that the amount of mental energy that you need to focus on getting something done that you are really passionate about, it is a job. Like, you know, a lot of people, I think, 
look at writing as, oh, isn't that a luxury? A room of one's own, you know? <laughs> Which, well, it's not It's not like that at all. I mean, it takes a lot out of you. Like I always, my, my husband always jokes, He's like, oh, are you going to your cave now? Because I really just, I don't want to talk to anybody. I don't, I don't like anybody. I'm just going to write what I write. And then he's like, oh, are you finished now? Can you come out? <laughs> and I agree with that. I mean, writing is very much like, it's a blend of both for me. I think something that I can't remember which author told me this when I first started writing, uh, when I first started trying to be a published author is that you write your first draft or your first book or whatever for yourself. And then you edit for the business. And that's a really hard thing to adjust for because when you're rating something that's creative, that's flesh and blood and tears, it's really hard to think, okay, I've written this thing that's perfectly for me. It's exactly what I want to express. And then you have to reconcile that with what is the market doing? What does your agent want? What does your editor want? What do your reader want? And you have to understand and have to try and find a balance, that balance of creativity and marketability, which can be a hard thing for people to balance. Yeah. And with... So with your first book, so with Yesterday's History, talk me through where the idea came from and why why you wanted to tell that particular story and why also why you were writing it, like you said, like you write it for yourself, but where, where when did you make that decision to go, do you know what, this is important and people need to see this? Sure, so where is it? Really quickly, this is the book, the hardcover of it. Yesterday's history very quickly uh, follows Andre Cobb, who's a 17-year-old black boy who's recovering from a liver transplant, who inadvertently discovers that the liver has given him the ability to time travel and travels back to 1969 and engages in a love triangle between an activist in 1969 who lives in his house and the younger brother of the organ donor who is tasked with the ability and the job to teach him how to master time travel. So it's a lot. It's a love triangle. It is a time travel story. It has basically three different characters who need their own arcs. And it's it's a big it's it tries a lot of things and I personally think it accomplishes all of them because I'm the author. But um, the idea for the book was kind of random. Three kind of key things. I love science fiction. It's my favorite genre. It's always been my favorite genre. Um, and I wanted to write a story that kind of reflected that. Sci-fi, along with historical, are kind of the two genres in YA that are least represented, right. which is great because they're also sometimes the hardest to sell because they are the least represented. So yeah. why not do a book that has both inside of it? Um, and I just wanted to see more science fiction. I want science fiction to me, my um, undergraduate major is in a science field. So I wanted to write a book that kind of reflected that, but also because science fiction at its core asks big human questions. That's what science fiction is and uses technology and kind of outlandish ideas to explore that. And so it seemed like a perfect theme for a black and queer character to be able to explore. I'm also a huge fan of period pieces. Um, I obsessively watch them. I haven't recently done any really good ones, but I used to do them a lot when I was younger. And so I wanted to kind of write a book that harkened back to my younger self. And Yesterday's History very much has the banter and the wit of like Pride and Prejudice and the will they, won't they, and the longing stares. And so I wanted to represent that inside the book. And also like, I just wanted to write a really good queer story for black kids like who didn't have to deal with heavy themes of racism, but still had those things because that's part of the black experience, sadly in America. And I wanted to have a book with a happy ending. And so the idea kind of just came when I was at BEA about two and a half years ago. And I visited Stonewall for the first time. And I was like, why not write something that has to do with yeah. the history? I mean, we see a lot in literature that we have these themes of reflecting the past through letters and having a bounce between chapters. And that to me was kind of a tired thing. So I was like, why not do it through time travel? Originally, the book was with a blood donation that allowed him to be able to time travel, but it didn't allow me to get the really human aspect that I wanted. So yeah. completely scrapped it and made an organ donation. This is Netflix. This is so Netflix. Oh, thank you. This is a binge worthy, amazing. God, I am just amazed that you have so many elements in your story and they're all so unique. The premise is really unique. Thank you. Thank you. I'm very proud of this story. It, it took a long time because, like I said, I scrapped it. So I wrote 150,000 words because it was written twice. Um, and the second time I rewrote it, I rewrote it in two months. So it was a very, very fast rewrite. And then the editing was done in about three months with past pages and everything. So it's been a, it's been a long journey for these 303 pages. That is impressive. Good for you. Thank you. And, and did, did you... Uh, when you were ready to go on submissions, did you do Pitmad? Did you did you do any of the the um, Twitter kind of um, open calls, or did you start doing just direct to agents? 
Uh, so I actually got my agent through, uh, I had another agent at first. And so I got my agent, I switched agents and I got my agent through that. So the switching was the way that I got it. Jim McCarthy at Steel oh, yeah. is my agent. And so I got him because I switched agent. We had been talking before when I was looking for different qualities and agents, he kind of fit all the qualities. I sent him a kind of a giant proposal packet because like I said, I'm very type A. <laughs> the proposal packet had like a page of why I would make a good agent, a client a hundred pages of a book that I was working on and then kind of eight other ideas that I was working on. And wow. so I committed it on like a Friday. He offered me rep on the next like Wednesday because another agent had offered rep and then we signed two weeks later. Damn. So that is, that is quick work. But also, do you know what? Like, I mean, I can imagine seeing something like that come through. It just shines right through probably so many others. I think, and this is where... <clears throat> You know, I've said I've I've had this conversation with other authors before, and people who have asked me like, "Oh, submissions and all that," and the you know, agents have revealed things that people send them that is, it just doesn't make any sense, or they misspell their names and all that. And I think because you are a type A, and I recognize this also in myself, you you really have to present yourself in a certain way. You have to be compelling. You have to be on. You know. Yeah. And that's what shines through. That is the X factor. Yeah, fully. And I I also like am very conscious about privilege too, especially in the book industry. I was very lucky. I had built connections with authors. Actually, one of Jim's current clients actually helped me by giving a reference to Jim, a referral for me. But like not everybody has that. There's yeah. I spent years in the book community building up relationships. And that's like a privilege thing. Like it's very much a privilege thing. And I'm very lucky to have that. Um, and I'm very grateful for it. And but not everybody can do that. Not everybody can spend hours on Twitter to build these relationships. No. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so I think getting an agent and getting a book published is very much skill. But yeah. publishing is not a meritocracy. It's very much about luck and where you if you're in the right place at the right time. Yeah. And that's just something that I think that we don't tell enough budding authors that even the best books out there that could be bestsellers don't get published because they're not at the right time. Yep. And sometimes the worst books that shouldn't get published are there at the right time. And it's not a reflection of the author or their skill of a person if they get through the gauntlet. And I'm so glad you said that because that's such an important message to anybody who might be watching this. And I've had so many conversations with people going, well, hang on a minute. How come this, whatever this book is, is on a shelf and mine it could be amazing, but it's just not the right timing. And it, it it depends on what's trending. It depends on, like, the industry is really fickle. And they also have to, you know, agents aren't monsters. They also have to make a buck, you know, and they also have to work within certain parameters as well. So it's, yeah, it's really hard to navigate. But what you what you are showing is that it takes a lot of work to build those relationships and it takes time. And it's part of that is you're basically marketing yourself. Yeah, exactly. And I think there's like many different ways you can go about. There's no correct way about getting an agent. There's no, I mean, there, there are correct ways, which is the right way that is respectful, but there's no like one path. Some no. people do the slush pile and they go that path. Some people get an MFA and they build relationships at conferences. Some people build relationships on Twitter. I mean, at the core, this is a very cliche saying, but it's the book that matters. Yeah. All of those things, that relationship that I built, the fact that Jim and I had talked beforehand when I had was first querying books helped, but it wasn't the deciding factor. It no, was the exactly. story at the core. And so I think that like you'll a lot of budding authors will hear different stories from every different author. There's very few authors who have the exact same story. Yeah. And that worked for them, but it might not work for you, and that's completely okay. Yeah, and I think you just have to feel it. And I think right. you know, some somebody um, I was talking to was saying, oh, well, I'm going to try my hand at writing erotica or whatever, because it's the number one, you know, selling genre. I'm like, but is that who you are? Is that your voice? And they're like, well, no, but, you know, they're looking at it from the money perspective. I'm like, exactly. you, can't, you can't do that. You cannot no. yeah. write for the market. Um. So I was gonna like, so now with the second book, um, tell me, was that a different process or did you kind of approach it the same way? Where'd you get the seed of the idea for I'm so not over you? So part of it was me being stubborn and I just wanted to try something new. And so I just messaged my agent and was like, I wanna write a rom-com. I've been watching a lot of them. I've been reading a lot of them and I kind of just wanna do it. And he was like, you've never written a rom-com before. And I was like, white men become presidents and they've never been presidents. 
well. <laughs> like, let's let's try it. And I think that's like one of the things I like most about Jim. He doesn't say no. He <laughs> says yes and or yes or or yes with a caveat. So he was like, let's try it. So I wrote a lot of different proposals. So I sold I'm So Not Over You in a two-book deal over on a proposal, which basically means for anyone who doesn't know that I only wrote 50 pages in a very detailed synopsis. And I wrote a lot of proposals for Jim. I think I wrote four or five proposals, each 50 pages of a book. So I wrote about 300 pages before this book sold. So I practically wrote a whole book, even though it wasn't that book. Um, and so the idea just kind of came from a lot of what ifs. So I started like reading rom-coms and finding the tropes that I like. I have a lot of rom-com friends who are basically like authors make careers off of tropes that they love. So find what type of trope that you love. Yeah. And so I just kind of started exploring it. And then Jim is a very methodical agent. He's one of his greatest strengths to me is his ability to plot and to find plot holes and to help you twist the plot into its right um, form along with his like shrewdness in the business decisions. And so he was very much like, this is great, but this doesn't work. This is great, but this doesn't work. And each time that we wrote, we got a little bit closer until he was finally like, send me 15 different rom-com ideas. Doesn't matter how well they thought out they are and let's pick from there. We whittled it down to this one. We wrote it. I started writing that rom-com, I think it was no October of 2019, finished an edit pass in November, sent it to Jim. We had holidays and such. We went on sub in January of 2020 and the book sold in April of 2020. That is awesome. Yeah. And it, and it sounds like, you know, it's so nice when you have a good team, even if it's one or two people who challenge you a little bit, you know, and because they know you know, th there's a nice balance between kind of obviously Jim knows who you are, but he also knows the market. And I think like he doesn't steer you in a direction that is solely one, you know, one way. He takes care of you. That's good. Like, and that kind of that en enhances your storytelling probably over the over years, you know? Yeah, I've definitely gotten better because of the like, when I first started writing, I had very literary ideas, which is always not the best for YA. There's many good literary fiction books in YA. YA doesn't always lean towards literary fiction, which is unfortunate, um, which is I could have many hours of conversations about. And so he was like, let's try our hand at commercial books. And so I was like, I don't know how to write a commercial book. And so he basically explained it to me and I have no problem passing this knowledge on. He said a commercial book is a book that you can summarize and know everything about the book in one sentence. And so I was like, great. So he was like, so write me 20 different one sentence commercial ideas and I will help you understand which ones are or are not commercial so you can explore them. And since then I've been using that to like come up with any books that I like plot and it's been incredibly helpful. Jim is as much my agent and my business partner as he is a teacher. Not every agent is like that, which no, is like yeah. age is different. Some are very hands-off and that's great for some people. Some are very hands-on and that's great for some people. And I know myself and I think that's the biggest advice I can give to authors is that to know yourself and to not be ashamed of anything like as you are as a person. Like I'm, and I have no problem saying this, very much a diva. Like I email Jim <laughs> multiple times a week and he answers them at his own pace. And wow. it's just works for us because that's how we work. Another agent will probably drop me with the amount of times I email. <laughs> but, that's, but that's the type, way, type A. He has to understand that a type A is going to be like, well, actually, hang on a minute. I have one more thing. Just yes. one more thing. <laughs> I think this morning I've had, even today, I've had 10 emails with Jim back and forth. Oh. And it's only 30. So this is my life. I love that. And it's funny, when 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 you were talking about um, I'm so not over you, I just, for some reason, I can picture you, if that was made into a movie, you have to be in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are many coffee shop scenes in the movie, so very much like Stephanie <laughs> Myers is in that little bistro in Forks, Washington. I would love to be in the background somewhere. <laughs> well, I can, like, because you just have the personality for it. You just you lend yourself to like, just being part of a story. It's great. That'll be great. I'd love that. <laughs> now, so what I'm gonna, like, I'm gonna start asking you questions from the publishing side, because uh, Marissa and I were talking the other day and, and she kind of, from her perspective, I'm gonna get into it from that side. So, um. You know, she was saying that we can't possibly understand somebody's lived experience, but there's there's a lot of pressure to get things right for in a certain way for the publishing world. Um, and you've worked as a sensitivity reader. Um, so what kinds of things are you looking for when you're working on a project? So you're kind of on the other side of it. 
Um, you know, what do you do about things that you want to learn more about? So specifically, I am a sensitivity reader for only two things, and that's black rep and queer rep, specifically mm -hmm. queer male rep, queer cis male rep. So I have a very, very focused avenue, even with the black rep, like I have turned down projects because my sensitivity readers are for black middle class rep because black uh, lower class is very different than black middle class rep. Right. And so when I'm reading, like I have like pretty major caveats whenever I send it to an editor. This is just my point of view. You could ask another clone of me who has the exact same experiences and we would have a completely different point of view. And my ideas are just suggestions. They aren't requirements. I've been fairly fortunate that a lot of my books that I've sensitivity read are, are great and the edits that I provide just help take it to the next level to help add some richness to it. And so it's not so much like this is completely horrible, everything in this rep is bad. <laughs> so basically what I'm looking for when I sensitivity read is, does this give me as a reader pause? Does this lean into any stereotypical tropes of these groups that exist? Or does it inadvertently cause any harm to the group that I'm reading for or even tangentially? leaning into stereotypical tropes, for example, about how gays view like lesbians in the community doesn't really affect the gay community, but it does hurt the LGBT community as a whole. Yeah. And so how do we fix these inside the story? And also how do we just not lean into tropes that are just like boring and just redone? Not every gay character has to be in love with fashion. So yeah. if that's not integral to the story, can we take it to the next level? Because it's important to have, especially teens, where these books are their first foray into sometimes this representation and will formatively decide how they view groups, especially Absolutely. if the teens who read them are not part of the group. How do we push those narratives and those envelopes open? And what what made you decide to do that? Because it's it's really wonderful, it's really helpful, and it kind of makes people feel heard and seen. Like what what do you what made you go, do you know what? I really want to do this. I want to help people see things on a bigger, in a bigger way. So there's two answers to that. And my 2021 goal is to be more honest with like my interviews and such. One is money. Um, I was not in the best financial shape when I started my writing career. I was making like $35,000 a year living in Washington, DC. For anyone who knows the East Coast, that is barely livable. <laughs> Oh, that is hard. It was hard. I don't know. I It's a blur of how I did it for a year, but I did it. Um, And I wanted to make more money and I wanted to really get involved with the book community and learn about it more. So that was one side of it. The other side of it is that there just aren't many and there still aren't many black queer editors. There aren't black, many black field published authors because there are many black queer authors who are trying to get through the gatekeepers. There are not many who have made it through. And I wanted to like help and fix that because publishing will say, oh, we don't have anybody to reach out to for this rep. So we weren't able to find anybody, which is why we didn't have a sensitivity read. It's, and I'm like, well, now you know at least one exists. And I've steered yeah. them to others when I'm like, I'm too busy or it's like a book that I'm not great at. There's, I'm starting to steer and I've done it for past year towards other black queer published authors and non-published authors because published authorship is just a gatekeeping term. Yeah. There's, like we said, there's, many non-published authors who can't get through who could probably wipe the floor with best-selling authors with their writing skills. Yeah. And so I just did it because I think it's important. I think it's a great way to give back. And uh, my background is in social justice. And to me, books are a form of social justice and they're a form of rebellion. So why not make rebellion that is good rep along the way? That's a great point. And do you, do you feel that there's still a lot of pushback and there's still a lot of, well, no, that's fine. We don't need, you know, there is some pushback. So because I'm working on three books right now, I haven't been able to take many sensitivity reads. I'm also in grad school. The biggest pushback is pay. Yeah. So it's really hard for sensitivity readers from my experience to get good pay. And I have come from the nonprofit experience I've, where all my jobs have been nonprofit, which also has a pay issue. So I have learned very, very well to talk about pay. And so I always try to talk about and the publishing paid me trend in Twitter was a great trend. I have gotten many sensitivity reads from big fives that offered me $250 to read a 90,000 word book in two weeks. That is 30 cents a page if I'm lucky. Those are pennies on the work that you're asking me to do, the emotional work you're asking me to do. So the wow. biggest pushback comes when I'm like, I need to be paid $500, $600 to read this book, especially if you want to rush. Yeah. And it's hard. It's hard because publishing will always be like, oh, this is the standard. This is what we pay for everybody. 
But then the problem is that your standard is too low and you're paying everybody too low. This is not a me thing. This is a baseline thing. But also, if you don't have that kind of standard and you don't pay for quality work, then you're homogenizing everything when it comes to the books that you're putting out. And then, then it's like a cyclical problem. Then kids are reading books going, the same tropes, the same, you know, the same yeah. stuff is kind of being said about, you know, voices that should be a lot more diverse and colorful and like, you know, situations should be really different. And like the descriptions, it's just, it becomes a bigger problem. And I think when, personally, I think when the publishing industry recognizes that it's one of the most important things to spend money on, then I think that it will shift, but it'll take a while probably. It will definitely. Publishing moves, it's a behemoth that moves very, very slowly when it doesn't want to, but yeah. then we can crash books and have them come out in nine months. So like how mm -hmm. we can give million dollar advances to the Trump administration. So yeah. how slowly and how, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a funny thing because you know, they'll, they'll want something. It was like the whole conversation that was, that was very um, mercurial about American dirt. Mm. And I, as a daughter of immigrants, I, I found it problematic because it's like somebody that wasn't Ukrainian writing about the Ukrainian experience. It was very tricky to navigate that. But at the same time, the publishing world is saying, yes, but isn't it good for something to be out there about, you know, the Mexican immigrant experience? At least somebody's writing about it. Well, <laughs> that's, you know, there's a middle ground that, that isn't reached. It's, exactly. It's, you're living in absolutes. Um, when Marissa and I were talking about sensitivity reading, um, you know, we were both kind of intrigued by the concept of freelance sensitivity reading. And it feels like the step, a step in the right direction for publishers. Um, you know, but I think we wonder if this is a band-aid solution and we should be seeing more permanent roles around people being sensitivity readers. Is that something that should be a given in publishing houses? I definitely think it should be, but I think even before that, what needs to happen is that we need to have more people of color and more diverse voices inside the boardroom. They need to be inside the room where it happens. I mean, Lee and Lowe released their statistics. I don't remember the exact numbers, but I think 86% of publishing is white, if I remember the number from this year yeah. correctly. So if you have a book about a black child who grew up in Atlanta, for example, and every person in the room from the marketing, from the editors is an upper or a middle-class white person who lives in Brooklyn, how are they going to spot any problems or issues inside the book when you yeah. do not have a diverse room to discuss these issues because every person brings in their own lived experiences. They bring in their preconceptions and their assumptions about people which inform how they view a story positively and negatively. You have stories written about these experiences from white people that cater towards the white experience so it feels more relatable because it's palpable for white people while you have authentic voices from the black experience which aren't palpable for, for white people. So you get the, I can't connect with the character story because it forces yeah. you to reconcile with a truth that you're not comfortable reconciling with. Yeah. And I think, I think the, I think it's still there, are, you know, it's still trying to, the industry is still trying to make it palatable. So they'll have a photograph of one person that has a different skin color and then everybody else is sitting there and they all look the same. Exactly. That's not that's not solving the problem. No, it's not. It's putting a band-aid on it and it's yeah, it's placating the problem. Yeah. Do you think young authors such as yourself who are tackling this so wonderfully and so eloquently and so creatively, do you think that it, there's a bit of pressure on you guys or do you think it's important for kind of slowly people to start representing the bigger voices and then those other voices will follow along. Yeah, I mean, so I don't know about other authors because each experience is different. But for me, I definitely feel some amount of pressure as a double minority. I have the black experience, I have the queer experience, and that is a very niche experience for a lot of people. And especially when I'm writing stories, it's like their blackness and queerness is interwoven into everything about my characters. And because of that, it is impossible to separate that from my characters live experiences inside stories. For example, I'm working on a work in progress right now that's very much focused on dark academia in a private school in Montana, actually. And um, as it's one of the oldest private schools in my story that's existing, 
And how can an old white institution from 1779 not have issues with black people and the type of students that go there? So how can I have this character who represents 4% of the diverse population not have to reconcile with the issues of race? But at the same yeah. time, this is not a race story. And I don't want the whole story to be about race, even though that might be what publishing wants because it's easy to digest and easy to understand and easy yeah. to market. So it's a balance between representing stories that sometimes talk about it because race and sexuality is in our country political and its core, but not making the whole story about it so it just becomes that story. Yeah. And do you think you'll, you'll because you did YA and you've done um, adult, are you going to kind of dip in and out of that or do you want to specifically focus on one or the other? Because I think you speak to both really well. Um, but there is a, a the way I there's a part of you there's like this really big YA heart that sits in how you approach your writing. Do you think do you kind of see you yourself in both, or do you want to go one or the other? That's a hard question because I have never been someone who's good at making decisions. Um, <laughs> in college, I jumped around majors four times. I have been employed not because of firing, just because I'm so good at what I do and I'm just kind of flighty at jobs. I've been employed in maybe eight different places in the past five years. Um, and I switched my majors several times. And the major that I settled on was like a custom major. So I very much never settle. Like my agent would tell me that it would be good to write in one genre for several books so that you can build up a brand. But I'm like, but why do that when I can write in so many different genres? Yeah. So I definitely see myself writing in YA for a while. I definitely see myself writing in rom-coms for a while. But the thing about my rom-coms, which made it a little bit harder, very much like, the marketing of Red, White, and Royal Blue is that the rom-coms have a 25-year-old main character. So it straddles that YA adult right. without having most typical rom-coms have 30-plus-year-old yeah. characters. So it's relatable to teens because, I mean, frankly, which is another issue in publishing, an 18-year-old is honestly closer in lived experience to a 21 and 22-year-old than a 14-year-old. Yeah. And so there's that crossover appeal to it. So for now, I'm just going to write my books, which is what my agent and I have decided is write the book, I'll read it and decide how to market it. Good, that's smart. Oh, wow, that's so much easier. Yeah. That way you're not, it's, it, it is like, actually, it's funny you should say that about college because it is like entering college and somebody going, what's your, what's your major gonna be? You're like, I don't, I don't know. I have to actually live it before yeah. I decide. Exactly. Yeah. Right, so we're reaching the end of the show and I wanna kind of ask you some really fun questions. One sure. of them is, um, <clears throat> if you could do anything else other than what you're doing, this is gonna be a really hard question for you, but <laughs> yeah. pick something that you could do for work if it wasn't what you're doing now. Hmm. <laughs> the problem is that I'm getting a second master, so the answer that I would usually give is something that I'm going to be doing in the future. So that's a cop-out answer, so I don't wanna give that. I would probably be a screenwriter um, for movies. I would probably I watch a lot of movies. Before the pandemic hit, I saw a hundred movies a year in movie theaters every single year. So I watch a lot of movies. So that's probably what I would be doing. But since that's like also a writing career, it also feels like a little bit of a cop out for me. Um, so if it had to honestly be anything, I'd probably be some type of professor or teacher of some sort. That's probably what I would be. I've done teaching before and I enjoy it in like volunteer positions, but yeah, that's probably, or something international, like running like a, like an NGO or something. Wow. First of all, I could totally see you as a screenwriter. Please tell me you're going to have to try that one day. Please. I will, I will. I was going to start to get a certificate in screenwriting before the pandemic hit. And I was like, I need to go back to, my background's in public health with a focus in infectious disease and um, epidemiology. And so I'm after I get my MFA, I'm gonna go back and get my MPH, my master's of public health to like join and deal more with health equity and health distribution of like disease, how, health distribution and policy affects marginalized communities. So I was gonna do a screenwriting, but lives are long and I have some time. It's like a one year program, so I'll go back to it later. You have you have shoehorned a lot into your life as it like as you are now. So I your life is just gonna be brimming with amazing things. That is because I have existential dread about death and not <laughs> accomplished enough about I'm only 29 and I'm already telling my boyfriend like my life is half over and I haven't done it. And he's like, please shut up. One of my favorite things that I tell my friends, and they always think I'm slightly weird when I say this, I'm like, if I'm debating whether to do something or to write something or just to do an adventure or whatever, 
uh, I say out loud, I'm going to be dead one day. And they just go, <laughs> and I'm like, well, actually, because it's true. Like, if I if I get that into my head, I'm going to be dead one day. I might as well just do it. Just do exactly. it. Just do it. The worst that can happen is that you waste. And this is kind of a privileged thing to say, but the worst that can happen is that I waste time and waste money. That's the yeah. worst that can happen by trying something. I know it's very lucky that I can be able to waste money yeah. to try things, but like if the worst that I lose is just a little bit of that, then why not try it? Yeah. So good. Um, so now is there, <clears throat> is there something you could share with people who are watching um, about yourself or your writing process that people might be surprised to know? Yes, maybe. I've talked about it on Twitter a little bit, but two things, uh, I guess maybe three things. One, um, any person who's an author has seen the like Publishers Weekly announcements every Tuesday and Thursday when books come out. Whenever I am starting a book, I make my own fake Publishers Weekly announcement. I Photoshop my picture into it. I decide, um, as you can see on some Publishers Weekly, it says like a good deal, a nice deal, a very good deal, which tells you roughly how much money the book sold yeah, for. Exactly. I decide how much my book is going to be sold for. <laughs> I decide which editor it's going to go to. I decide what foreign rights are going to be sold. And I like create that and put that like in my digital wall for the file of the book on the top of it. So every single time I open it, I see it. Oh um, God. That's what I do. I'm also very much, when I was younger, into anime, very much into anime. So I usually pick two or three songs that represent like, because I write books and all my books have part one, part two, part three, part four. Yeah. So I pick two songs, like beginning credits and end credit songs for each part, like different seasons of the show so that it has like a pseudo soundtrack. That is awesome. I think music has a lot uh, to do with personally my writing process, but I know a lot of people have to listen to certain songs to get certain scenes out. So oh, yeah. that, that totally makes sense. Definitely. Um, but I... <laughs> I love that you are manifesting basically your own yes. publisher's week. <laughs> to be fair, it has gone well so far. My rom-coms went to the exact editor that was my top choice. Oh, in my and so it seems to be working for me. And keep, it's part of my writing process. Keep manifesting. <laughs> exactly. And it's like how I write a book. I start with that. I then go to a dust jacket of a book. If I can write that, then I can write a full synopsis. If I can do that, I can start writing a book. So it starts as a one sentence and exposed into a 70,000 word book. It's great, it's a type of mood board. I think yeah. I really I really feel like, and I hate the word manifesting because it became such a buzzword, but it, it really is true that if you put enough energy and focus onto something out into the universe, something starts happening eventually. Yeah, 100%. Um, and <clears throat> this is, I think this is gonna be an interesting um, question. If you could change anything about the publishing, publishing industry, just with a snap of your fingers, what's one thing that you would want to change like tomorrow? That's an interesting question. I think the, oh, I know what I would say too. That publishing, you do not have to live in New York City to work, to work in publishing. Because if you don't have to live in, here's the thing, it is impossible to live in New York City, not impossible, very hard and work a full-time job and live off $30,000. Oh God, yeah, absolutely. And so it is, and, but $30,000 can spread very better in other cities. Uh, yeah. And so it is absolutely, out, and it prices out a lot of POCs and a lot of people who do not have intergenerational wealth to be able to work in publishing, which is partially what keeps publishing so light. So I think yeah. if we could change that so that you could be anywhere, frankly, in the world, we would have better applications, which means we would have a more diverse pool, which means that it would fix a lot of the problems. You know, that's a really, really great answer because it then leads me to thinking that this awful kind of change in the world with this pandemic, there's a new way that people are working. Yes. There's more digital, more remote. And I just wonder if that's going to open up a lot of new doors and for people to kind of think differently. You don't have to sit in an office nine to five to be successful. No, you don't. I mean, there's been studies that show that honestly, most people don't, when they sit in an office nine to five, don't actually work eight hours a day. I think you actually only work five hours a day of actually productive work. And also like, it just, it's dark comic comedic how members of the disabled community have like asked for these exact same accommodations that we've been asking for during the pandemic and that was too hard to do, but a little microscopic virus starts infecting people's bodies and we're somehow able to do it in the snap of our fingers. Yeah. Cause it's trending. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> exactly, because it affects the people who have power. Yeah, exactly, exactly right. Oh, I love this. Um, okay, and last question. <clears throat> you have to pick a desert island book. One book. That's it, you can't, no, not just one book. <laughs> to take with me? Yep. What's the, any book? Any book, but you have to know that you're gonna have to read it over and over again. <laughs> hmm. Oh, Real Life by Brandon Taylor, just because the writing is so good. And I, I read it twice now, and every single time I reread it, I learn more about it. And yeah, and I think that when I got off the desert island, eventually I could then pay Brandon Taylor to write about my experience, and we could both make a lot of money. Good answer. <laughs> right. Kosoko, I, I could just keep talking to you for hours. This is so lovely. And I've just loved having you on here. You are so wonderfully eloquent. And I think you're helping a lot of people see the industry in a just a different way and a younger way. And it's not <clears throat> intimidating. I think you're approaching it in just this really demystifying way, which is really helpful. So thank you for having me. It's been a great conversation. Thank you. Um, so tell people where to find you. Give me all the information. Sure. So you can find um, all my book information is on my website, Kosoko, K O S O K O, jackson.com. And then because I'm always on Twitter, literally almost 24 hours a day, I sleep from two to eight in the morning. And besides that, I'm on Twitter all day. Uh, <laughs> you can find me on Twitter at Kosoko Jackson, same thing, K O S O K O, or Instagram, which I'm trying to build up my present of, which is the exact same name. Perfect. Kosoko, thank you again. And I will, we need to do another episode uh, where we can catch up with. Of course. Your I'm next, free anytime that you want. Your next 15, 20 books come out. <laughs> <laughs> Fingers crossed. <laughs> See you later. Bye. Well, everyone, that was so much fun. And I really think that approaching the conversation about diversity, about queer voices, I think all of that is so not scary. It needs to be a conversation that is happening all the time. And I think, you know, we've just seen that somebody who is young, eloquent and intelligent is carrying the voices of so many. And so many people are now as a result of so many of these authors are going to kind of come out and, you know, start talking and people are gonna start listening. And I think um, the publishing industry will be better for it. So thank you so much for watching. Catch us every Friday at 2 p.m. Eastern. Um, and remember to click the link below to subscribe to be uh, alerted ahead of every episode. So see you next week.